Spare Me Your Mercy by Salmon Chapter 1 It Begins With a Loss Aside from her heartbeats, the old lady could hear the sound of heavy footsteps on wooden floor resounding in the house. She slowly opened her blurry eyes and saw only the darkness of the night. She cried out, slightly due to a pain that attacked her lower back as soon as she became conscious. It was so painful, too painful for a little woman like her to endure. Mrs. Ravivan, 70 years old, was a strong woman. Everyone called her that. She was a single mother of three sons. Her eldest, although wasn't wealthy, was a sustainable merchandiser and always had time for his beloved mother. Her unfortunate middle son died in an accident. Her youngest son was a police officer, situating in another province. She had been fighting with so many things her entire life, but never once had she given up. She struggled with her failed marriage, having to financially support all three sons' education by herself. Not to mention a mountain loan of the debt her husband left behind. Ravivan had hoped that she would eventually be well off, and everything had gotten better after she became a middle-aged woman. In the end, however, she lost her battle to a final stage endometrial cancer. Cancer ate away at her vertebral column along with her nerves, causing her unbearable agony. Without the morphine she received, she would have suffered from these agonizing pains as if she was in an everlasting hell. The footsteps approached nearer and nearer. The old lady gradually looked around to find the source of the sound she heard. When her vision finally adjusted to the darkness, Ravivan saw a silhouette of a man standing at the end of her bed. Surprisingly, she wasn't so startled by it. The shadow approached her slowly, before sitting on the edge of her bed. Its hand reached out to lay on her fragile skeletal one. Games, is that you? With a raspy voice, she called her deceased middle son. I missed you. That hand held hers firmly. I miss you too. You'll take me with you, right, James? Yes. The voice of the shadow echoed near her left ear. I want you to set your mind on your good deeds. You have donated money for hospital building construction, remember? The old lady nodded slowly, reminiscing the day she brought a white envelope with 10,000 baht into a fairway rural hospital. The money was donated as a fund for a new construction of a hospital ward. It was the biggest marriage she had ever made. Thinking about it, she felt strangely peaceful. The pain and agony began to subside. Mom, you're the strongest woman I've ever met. You've been through a lot of hardship in your life. Deep, soothing, soft tone lulled her to relaxation, for she knew this voice very well. Now, it's time. Don't be afraid. Keep your mind calm and all this pain will go away. You'll be far away, in a peaceful place with your son. This was all she wanted. Her eyes began to brim with tears of joy. Thank you. Just like the voice said, her pain began to fade away slowly. The old lady felt relaxed in a way she had never felt before. Her breath gradually slowed until her chest stopped moving. The pale, blurry eyes shut tight and would never open again. Revivan, time of death, 2.35 a.m. Me? A young physician pointed at himself. Expression of shock appeared on his face as other physicians in a conference room applauded. He turned to look at his colleague sitting next to him. She urged him to stand up with a broad smile on her face. Go, Gan. He bashfully smiled before he stood up and walked to the front of the medical staff conference room. He traditionally greeted the hospital director who was holding a certificate of honor in his hands, and then received it with humbleness. 
Dr. Guntapat's score slightly surpasses Dr. Bunnigate's. There was a soft laughter in the conference room. Dr. Bunnigate raised his hand to refuse with a smile. Just give it to Gun. Guntapat turned to bow his head to the director once again and quickly walked back to his seat. Dr. Sumsack, the hospital director, continued his speech. As an encouragement for every doctor, I've prepared the Outstanding Physician Awards. Everyone has a chance to get this award as long as you work hard, be friendly, and be a beloved one to all your colleagues. Take Gunn as a model. Gunn shook his head with a polite smile. As a family physician, he was taught to be a doctor who should understand and work well with others because he had to collaborate with many diverse groups of people. It could be this advantage that made him win the award. Gunn couldn't see that those surgeons who mostly has stressful works in the operating room having to assess and examine a flood of patients in a rushed manner would manage to get the votes the way he did. Looks like Kitty Pong wasn't so impressed with this. Dr. Ning, an obstetrician who was Gunn's close friend, moved closer to whisper in his ear. The person she talked about was an orthopedic surgeon who had a reputation for his coldness. Nah, his face is always like that. Gunn put the certificate of honor he had just received in a folder in his satchel. Aside from the delightful subject, I have to announce that... Director Samsag paused for a short while. It's such a shame that one of our physicians, Dr. Bunnicott from the forensic department, will resign and begin his new position as a professor in Bangkok. I'd like to invite all physicians to attend Dr. Bunnicott's farewell party this Friday. The one who could attend, please respond in our line group chat, so that my secretary could reserve tables at the restaurant for you. Our new forensic physician, who is going to work in Dr. Bunnicott's position, is Dr. Supapon. We expect her to meet you all on the day she begins her work here. Gunn turned to look at the younger physician who sat opposite him at the table. Bunnicott was a forensic physician who had recently gone through a traumatic experience. Gunn wasn't so surprised that he would resign to escape all the bad things that had happened to him. Several months ago, this young forensic physician involved in a mystery murder case that had him ended up being assaulted, kidnapped, and threatened for his life. All these ordeals that had happened to him must be too much for Bunnicott to handle. Gunn remembered the first day Bunnicott came to work after the ordeals. He didn't seem like himself. All Gunn could do was give him moral support and feel sorry for him. He was an excellent forensic physician, gifted with brilliant teaching techniques and loved by nurses and interns. A professor would be a role that suited him well in the next couple of months. After the meeting, all physicians went their separate ways to do their jobs. Gunn and Ning walked out together and went straight to an elevator in front of the conference room. Gunn was busy finding the physician's line group chat to sign up for Dr. Bunnicott's farewell party. Do you want to go? I can sign up for both of us. Gunn turned his head to ask his friend. Yeah, count me in. Ning leaned in to look at the screen of Gunn's smartphone. Gotcha, you're talking with girls again. What girls? I'm looking for the line group chat. Gunn hurriedly put away his phone. What's your plan for this afternoon? I've got two C-section cases waiting for me in the operating room. What about you, Gan? To the health station, and then I'll go to the funeral. At the temple in the city. Ning raised her eyebrows. Whose funeral? A home care patient. I visited there often because there are so many issues to analyze. She's a 70-year-old lady with a final stage CA corpus. It spread to her vertebral column, crushing her nerves. So the lady had a serious problem with pain. Several adjustments of her medication didn't help much. We planned to send her to a university hospital for pain control, but she couldn't come to the hospital any longer. 
Gunn sighed quietly. At least the pain is gone now. You did your best, Gunn. Ning lightly patted Gunn's shoulder. No one understands terminal stage patients like you do, Gunn. Well, there's just me, the only consultant in this hospital. Gunn looked up at his reflection in the mirror of the elevator. He was a 31-year-old man with a charming face. He had a distinctive feature of a native tie with yellowish pale complexion. Today he wore a short-sleeved lab coat, which was an intern uniform, over a long black shirt. Gunn still liked wearing this uniform, although he had already become a medical specialist. On his chest, green alphabets were embroiled, reading Guntapat Akaramaiti, MD. He was a family medicine specialist, obtained a diploma in occupational medicine, and was the only one in this hospital who had knowledge of palliative care. The elevator opened on the ground floor. The first thing you could see was the sea of patients who were waiting for physical examination in the afternoon. Ning turned around to wave him a goodbye before quickly walking straight to the direction of the nearby building where the operating rooms were located. Gunn went to a four-door pickup truck belonging to the hospital that parked at the front. He needed to go back to examine the remaining patients from this morning at the regional public health promoting hospital, and then went to pay respect to his former home care patient. Temperature in the temple was incredibly hot due to the blazing sunlight in the late afternoon. Gunn took off his lab coat, placing it on his shoulder. He stepped out of the hospital's truck and strode to the temple pavilion where the body of Mrs. Ravivan was laid. At the moment, the guests took turns to pay the dead respects and talked with the dead's relatives continuously. Gunn tried to look around to find someone he knew. The first two persons that he saw were the eldest son of Mrs. Ravivan and his wife. These two were the main caregivers of his former patient. The eldest son was Mr. Tongkum, a 45-year-old man who was currently a merchandiser. His wife was a seamstress. This family was considered wealthy compared with surrounding households. If you ask Gunn how he knew all this, the answer would be, this was a special talent of the family physician. Hello, Mr. Tongkom. Gunn put his palms together, greeting the middle-aged man who were busy rearranging chairs in the tent. Doctor! Tongkom shouted with a broad smile. He accepted the greeting from the doctor, putting his palms together and bow his head several times. I didn't know you would come. I'm so sorry for your loss. I wish everyone in this family to stay strong. Gunn pulled out an envelope with some amount of money in it. Please accept this. Thankum received the envelope and put his palms together to show a sign of gratitude. Thank you so much, doctor. I'll take you to pay my mother's respect. Gunn stood still for a while, looking at the face of the young Ravivan in a gold frame before picking up an incense stick. He prayed silently and then buried the incense stick into the pot. At that moment, Gunn could sense someone was staring at him. He raised his head and looked through the jaw stick pot to where the coffin lay. His eyes met the eyes of a man who was staring at him intensely. He had to be in his early thirties. The man had an average body, but very muscular. He could be seen from a white tight t-shirt he wore. He had tanned skin as if he'd been bathed in the sun. His thick, dark eyebrows made his face look fierce. His close cropped hair gave away his occupation. Gunn had never seen this guy before, but he didn't know if the guy would think of him as a stranger the way he thought. Mr. Thongkom walked straight to the man and led him to the direction where Gunn stood. That was when Gunn noticed the similarities between the two. And that was when it occurred to him that he had seen this man's face in the picture on the wall. Is this the police officer who was working in another province? He was Ravivan's youngest son, who Gunn had never had a chance to meet. Thinking of this, 
Gunn was dumbfounded. He stared at the man who was walking here as if he was enchanted. The man's eyes were alluring. That kind of gaze belonged to a stubborn, unyielding person. When he approached and came to stand next to Gunn, it could be seen that Gunn was a bit taller than him. Doctor, this is Captain Vassan, my younger brother. He's going to be an inspector soon. He's just moved here to be an investigator. Thuncombe gestured his hand toward the doctor and said in Thai northern dialect, And this is Dr. Guntapat, the one I told you about that helped me look after Ma at home. Wasan nodded his head slightly, but he didn't raise his hands to greet Gun. Gun didn't hold it against him anyway. If he hadn't mistaken from the information he heard, the youngest son of his family was older than him. Thank you for looking after my mom. Vasan's voice was stern, curt, and husky. Doctor, please take a seat. I'll bring you a glass of water. Thangkom led Gun to a sofa on the temple pavilion. Gun didn't want to refuse his kindness, so he walked to the seat prepared by Thangkom. He began to breathe freely again after he separated from Vasan. However, the awkwardness came back when the man followed him here and sat next to Gun. I was about to move here. Mom told me that she'll wait for me. Vasan gazed at the direction of the coffin. All I cared about was my career advancement, so I took the position in a big province. When mom was diagnosed with final stage cancer, I hurriedly planned to move back here, in my hometown, to take care of her, but I was one day too late. I often heard your mom saying she wanted to wait and see you. Gunn spoke with a soft tone before digging up the lesson from reassurance and sympathy course he had attended in medical class and put it to a good use. You must feel sorry that you missed the opportunity to come back and look after her. But don't be. Every time Mrs. Raviven talked about you, her face filled with pride. Naturally, talking this way would make others feel more or less better. However, Gunn couldn't tell at all how the man in front of him felt. You... You seem to know a lot about our family. Gunn fell silent for a few seconds before he smiled. I know everything about my patient's health. Health consists of physical, mental, and social health. I even know the soul of my patients and what their lives want in the end. Vasan moved his gaze back to Gunn's face. Then, my mom doesn't want to wait for me to return home. That's why she passed away so quickly before I came back. Gunn could sense anger in his voice. I understand that you're feeling sad and upset. Let me tell your mother's wish that she once told me. He reached out to touch Vasan's tie gently. She doesn't want to wake up and suffer from this agonizing pain any longer. Vasan closed his eyes. If that's what my mom wanted... I guess I have to accept it. At last, Gunn could make the person in front of him feel more relaxed. A young woman approached them and offered them two small bottles of cold water. Gunn said thank you, opened the lid and drank it. It was time to say goodbye to this family. I've got to go. If any of you have any health problems, you can always contact me at the hospital. Vasan glanced down at the hand which was still on his thigh making Gunn swiftly pull his hand back from the area that would make Vasan feel uncomfortable. Where are you from? Suddenly, Vasan asked Gunn. I'm from Nanthaburi. Just been here for three years. I see. That was all Vasan's response, and then he was quiet for a long period of time. That was supposed to be a signal to end this conversation. Gunn decided to bid Vasan farewell. After he said goodbye to Mr. Thangkom, Gunn walked back to the hospital's truck. Thus it is considered that today's mission was complete.